Okay, now presenting, we have Aziz R and Sam Wang with Sabio Holdings. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm the CEO, founder of Sabio Holdings. I have with me today Sam Wang, our SVP of Finance. Our CFO would be here today, except he's changing baby diapers with his newborn. So you know he wants to be here today right now. I'm glad uh, you're all here. I see some familiar faces in the, in the crowd. So let's talk about Sabio. Before I get into what we do, we want to talk about our fundamentals and why we are really now we have, and we'll talk about analysts covering us, but why we're seeing a lot of great momentum. So Sabio, as of full year 2022 revenue, audited revenues that just came out um, two months ago, we're up another 75% year to year at $42 million. This is third straight year of positive EBITDA and growing above 75%. We're considered an emerging leader in the streaming connected TV space. So some of you are familiar with connected TV in the sense that you have a Netflix app on your TV. And that is a subscription video on demand where we play is the ad supported aspect of that. And I'll get into that a little bit more. And CTV and OTT as of Q4 accounted for $12.7 million, 144% increase from Q4 21. So this is really our growth. This is really our growth uh, uh, a vehicle in terms of our segments. In terms of blue chip customer base, we deal with some of the biggest brands in the US. 100% of our revenue is US based. We are listed on the Canadian Stock Exchange as well as OTC, but we're primarily listed on the TSXV. But 100% of our revenue is US based. And we're working with the top 50 brands in the US. We're talking about brands like Amazon, GM, Ford, Bimbo, Bakery, Starbucks, McDonald's, and many others. And I'll explain why. And then we also have strong relationships with the agencies along with the brands directly. But the world of TV advertising is complicated. Not too long ago, there were only a few television channels people could watch. Running ads were simple because brands knew where to find the eyeballs. But now, traditional TV is becoming a thing of the past. And as people continue to cut the cord, brands know that streaming television and streaming apps are the future. But there are countless streaming apps people can watch and on more devices than ever before. This makes it hard for brands to connect with the right audiences, on the right devices, on the right streaming apps. Savio makes this easier. We built a completely unique analytics platform based on audience viewing behavior on mobile devices and streaming TV devices. Brands use this platform to better understand where their target audience is or watching content. This doesn't just help them find eyeballs, but allows brands to advertise to people who would actually want their product. So how does Sabio make money? When a brand pays Sabio to run advertising campaigns, some of those funds are used to run the ads, and Sabio keeps the rest as profit. Sabio helps brands understand their consumers, run effective advertising campaigns, and make the complicated world of advertising simple. what we're benefiting from is we're benefiting from this convergence into streaming TV and of course the use of mobile apps. And if you take a look at this, this chart, it really speaks to the growth ahead. Gen Zers at a higher percentage overall are using smartphones and they're using CTV. And that's really our sweet spot. We have been the, one of the very few companies and the only company now in the US space that has connected the dots between mobile and TV and that's all we do. We don't focus on desktop. We don't focus on mobile web. We're focused on apps on your phone and now apps on your TV. And that's really why we're seeing a lot of great traction. And in addition to that, what you can imagine in the US market, it's a highly, not only fragmented media market, but it's a highly diverse market. 49% of all consumers under the age of 40, uh, under the age of 18 are diverse. That is creating additional issues for advertisers to reach those consumers. And as I mentioned, uh, when I founded the company, I named it Sabio, which is why I experience in Spanish. And the idea was to understand not only this changing media landscape, which I already saw happening between my experiences in traditional TV and mobile, but to then take advantage of what's happening in the diversity space. And that is the wave we are riding. And you can take a look at this. This is traditional TV. The erosion is happening here, right? 
And initially it was SWOT, which is think of Netflix. That's starting to happen. And so what's happening is consumers are now moving to ad-supported models, such as Savio, and the apps that we help power on those platforms. And as you can see, the fast linear market will reach $4.1 billion next year in growing. And it's also a function of time spent. If you ask anyone under the age of uh, 25, do they have cable now, with the exception of folks who really like sports and they can't get the sports apps yet, you're going to find more people streaming than on traditional TV. And that trend is just going to continue. And you can take a look, time spent on streaming TV versus has now outpaced cable and, uh, well, I get to use this pointer, broadcast and cable and streaming. So I, just, I, have, I don't have a pointer like this, so it's very great. Um, and so you can see the growth connected over there and, and how we're continuing to benefit from that. And of course, as eyeballs move, so do dollars and the opportunity ahead. And we're really in the early stages of this right here, right? This is the early stages of spend, and we're really looking to accelerate. So not only are we benefiting from a changing marketplace, we're, we're benefiting uh, from a consumer appetite changing in terms of consumption, but we're benefiting from the, the onset of the dollars that are heading that way. And as I mentioned, there are now more paid TVs. There, there's now more cord cutters in the U.S. than there are paid TV subscribers. And this number, if you can imagine in recessionary times, it's just going to continue to accelerate. So what do we do and how do we, as we mentioned, we talked about, you know, how we help brands and agencies help them reach targeted audiences, but we do more than that. We have three components to our company, and this is what makes us a unique tech, fully complete tech stack and unique in our space. First of which is, as I mentioned on that video, we work with brands and agencies to help them reach those consumers and we run targeted ads for them. The second way is app science which is our unique analytics and insights. This is a propriety to us, and so is this. We built these internally, in-house. Then April of last year, we acquired Vidillion. And what Vidillion does is Vidillion has technology to actually launch apps, help monetize apps even more. So if you can imagine, between the combination of these three components, we have the most complete end-to-end -end stack in the space, outside of someone like Roku. As I mentioned, we have the the ability to target consumers, reach them effectively. We now have the ability to have unique supply because we're now launching apps and we're connected, providing technology for the apps. And then finally, we're providing the SaaS analytics capability. All three are coming together to benefit us in this, this ever-changing marketplace. I want to dig a little bit deeper into this unique insights and analytics capability we had, have. So what we do is we take you all have mobile phones in this room, right? And your mobile phones are essentially transmitting IDs off those phones. And so we started off as a mobile company, as I mentioned. And so in 2016, we started building our mobile ecosystem of IDs. And so today we have roughly about 280 million IDs that are flowing through our system every day. Sorry, monthly. Uh, every month, 200 million mobile IDs flowing through. And then we cross-reference it with 110 million CTV devices. So you're at home, you're using your, uh, you know, if you're in the U.S., obviously, as we all are, you're using your gaming app, for example. And we have a relationship with that, either the gaming app provider or the people who are selling in the ads in that, and we're placing some ads, and now we're seeing some of that data come back. Now we're also seeing your streaming behavior off of streaming apps. We're connecting the two, and we're, we're enriching this, we're understanding this, we're creating, making sure there's no fraudulent data in between. And then we're spinning out 55 million homes, validated households. Now, give you some context, Nielsen has 40,000 households. Nielsen, the gold standard, has 40,000 households that they use. We're validating 55 million homes and we continue to enrich these homes and understand them. And where this really is effective this is especially effective in the streaming world. I mean, you can look at some of the, um, what Nielsen has done and talked about and how they're trying to catch up in the space. They lack a deep understanding there. Not only in that aspect of it, but if you think about um, the idea of diverse audiences, Hispanic consumers, they have mobile phones. They're also using streaming. They don't necessarily show up on panels effectively. Black consumers, Asian consumers, 
This is an opportunity to understand them better, and that's what we're doing for our brands and agencies. And that's why we work with some of the biggest brands. Now, I get asked quite often is, Aziz, you, you're such a small company. How do you work with some of these major brands? And, and really what it started off with was, as I talked about my relationship, my history, I started off working with, um, had worked with some of these brands for years in my previous companies. And then when I went to them and I explained to them what we were setting out to do, helping them not only reach consumers effectively, but provide insights and understanding that that's not something Facebook does. Google does not do that. We do that. And that's what differentiates us. And so when we go to a McDonald's, we show them how they can reach a consumer. And I'll give you an example. With McDonald's, they're going to want to know, for example, how do I reach a consumer for my breakfast meals who will have coffee? Based off of our mobile data, we'll see visitations, for example, to people who visit Starbucks in the morning, at least that month. We'll then look at the apps that you know people have on their phones and say, these people are not only visiting Starbucks, but they also have kids in the home because they have mom and kids apps on their phones. And in addition to that, they're now watching these kind of streaming apps in the morning or afternoon. And so we're going to be able to cross-reference them and help McDonald's reach that consumer effectively. And that's how this all comes back. But then it doesn't stop there. We reach the consumer. We help them reach. They do their own independent analysis. And then we, provided some, we provide some additional insights and understanding. And so that's how this all kind of comes about. I'm going to hand it over to Sam Wang, our SVP of finance, to talk about our business. You are muted. You can mute or unmute yourself by pressing star six. Thanks, Aziz. So when I reflect on what have been truly driving the sales momentum for Savio over the last few years, the first thing that came to mind is customer stickiness. So if you look at our revenue in 2022, 72% of the revenue came from the repeat customers, while 75% of the top OTT and CTV customer we had in 2021 came back for recurring business. So the beauty of that is when you have the customer retention at such high level, it really helps to bring more stability in your sales model and also create a more cost efficiency. Now, meanwhile, we saw a 43% increase in our deal size as we continue to leverage the end-to-end -end tech stack, as you talked about earlier, to upsell our legacy mobile customers with the app science as well as the CTV offering we have. And at the same time, our sales productivity has saw a very meaningful uplift on a year-over-year -year basis. So revenue per, per seller, which is the classic metric we use to gauge the sales productivity, has increased to 40% on a year-over-year -year basis. Now, all those sales metrics translate directly into the great top line result we have in 2022. So as you might remember, I mean, we were working against a very tough macro backdrop in 2022, right? With the advertiser pulling back a budget, with a lot of headwind going on in the macro economy, but we still managed to expand our top line by 75%. And by the way, you know, we're not just burning through tons of cash, right? To achieve that top line expansion. So we are being very mindful about the profitability as well. So we have been operating um, as a profit business for three years. So we have now held 60% of growth margin for three consecutive years while generating positive adjusted EBITDA for three years as well. Now, diving a little bit deep uh, into the latest quarterly results, for those of you who followed us, uh, so Q4 2022 was the strongest financial quarter we ever had in the history of Savio. So we posted 66% uh, growth in top line revenue, while many of our peers have experienced either declining revenue or flattish growth. And if you look at the CTV and the OTT segment, the uh, growth rate we have is even more pronounced. So 144%, I mean, way outpaced the competitive growth rate of our public peers in the ad tech universe, as well as the CTV industry at large. Now, also in Q4 last year, the CTV and the OTT has really become a dominant sales category right, within our sales mix, accounting for 72% of the overall revenue we had. Now, you might, be, you might say, okay, Sam, uh, you know, it's not fair for you to just look at the Q4 revenue, right? Everyone know the advertising business is very seasonal. So a lot of uh, ad tech companies have their revenue backloaded in the second half of the year, particularly in Q3 and Q4. Now, if you were to carve out our CTV and the OTT revenue, right, and just plot it 
on a trading 12 month basis, you still see a very impressive growth trajectory, you know, as you can see on this graph. And we do expect this trend to continue, you know, as uh, Aziz mentioned earlier. So uh, the CTV market will continue to be a centerpiece of our growth strategy. So from a poverty comparable perspective, um, we generated about $42 million last year, but our market cap is only at $31 million. So if you do the math, uh, we are essentially trading at a 0.6x, right? Trading, uh, a trading revenue multiple. So which is a steep discount relatively to some of the public names you see on this list. And if our stock price continue uh, to stay at the current level, so that disconnect and discount will uh, get deeper and deeper. So we do believe uh, this presents a very compelling investment opportunity for many of you in, in this audience. Turning over to the analyst coverage, uh, we currently have uh, four analysts covering us right now, which is not common uh, for the company of our size. So we have a beacon and paradigm who have been covering us since day one. And uh, we recently have IA and Ace Capital uh, joining uh, the analyst coverage as well, uh, following our Q4 earnings release. We have a very clean cap, cap table, as you can see from here. Uh, the basic common shares, we have a 46 a million. Uh, the 40 dollars basis is a, a 54 million shares. Insider ownership, uh, we're currently at a 64%. That basically mean Aziz and the rest of the management team's interests are highly aligned with the shareholders, and we are all very committed and motivated to make Savio a success story. So with that, I'm going to turn back to Aziz, who is going to talk about our fantastic board. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. And so, so not only are we executing at high level, but we've assembled an impressive team across the board and an equally impressive board. And so, as Sam mentioned, 64% of the company is inside ownership. And that really means what, what that requires is an even more uh, illustrious board like we have. Because you want to make sure, obviously, from an investor perspective, that that much own inside ownership that we're looking at at the interest of the investor. And so the board we've assembled, Paula Madison, former GE officer, uh, currently a part owner of the African Channel and was former owner of the WNBA basketball team, LA Sparks. Carl Farrell, former chief revenue officer of SAS Institute um, to really kind of bring about, help us connect on the SAS side in the business and to continue to help us grow that app science business. Jennifer Cabocinto, who was uh, the former CFO of the Golden State Warriors basketball team, NBA basketball team up until a year ago. And now she's CFO of 2K Gaming which is uh, one of the largest publishers in the U.S. that does all the NBA games and, and those kind of. And then finally, Moise Karaj, who is managing director of Focal Point Ventures. And so we not only have great execution, we have an awesome team, but we have a really, really uh, amazing board that holds us accountable and holds me accountable. And then we have, we're about 120 strong global offices across the U.S. and uh, offices along in Toronto, London, and Hyderabad. And then finally, investment summary. We have the right team. We have 174 years of combined experience, core members together working at nine plus years together. 40% of the team is dedicated to product innovation. And then finally, we're strategically positioned. We are in a growing space with compelling tech that's unique and differentiated, and we continue to accelerate at that. Having said that, I will uh, take some questions. All right. Oh. So it's currently a little bit over $3 million, and we do have a banking facility with the Avid Bank. Um, we have uh, the credit limit is about $7 million. We still have a, a close to $4 million in tap at this point. It's basically a LIBOR plus 1%. Yeah, it's a very uh, reasonably priced. Yeah, yeah and I, I forgot to mention, so when I started the company, I bootstrapped it, uh, and then I got very expensive uh, initial debt, which we then, when we did, and and... I should explain this. The reason we did this RTO process in the Canadian market is because it provided us an opportunity to do two things. It provided us an opportunity. We're a U.S.-based company, 100% of revenue is U.S. But what it did is it allowed us to get a good valuation and currency uh, to then do acquisitions down the road. And so we really liked in, the, in terms of like 
the cost of operating a public company in Canada, especially on the TSXV venture, is a lot less. And so there are benefits on that. And so when I made the decision to do that versus traditional VC round, um, it was really with those ideas in mind. And so we, as soon as we did that, we refinanced debt and we really kind of went into it. That's right. So we actually, Double Airfy is like a partner of ours. They are very much focused in on fraud mitigation relative to what we do. Um, we more closely compete with the Magnites. Our three core competitors in, are Roku, Magnite, and Trade Desk. It's closely more Magnite than anyone else. That's who really we compete with a lot more than. And so if you look at our kind of company and their, their revenue, it's, I mean, in terms of our directory, our number, sorry. So we do, we have a combination of options in RSUs, uh, so more options than RSUs historically. I mean, we primarily use those to uh, incentivize our internal employees, right? So typically it's on a couple of year terms and it, uh, we don't have a cliff. So basically we'll be vesting over a period of three years. And That's I don't know, there's term. a percentage that I yeah. think are in the money. Most of them are, the options are in the money. Yeah. I could, we could check. I'm not sure actually on that. Sure. Um, so this this is the reason I actually, we acquired this company, Vidillion. What this does is, if you could imagine, right here is where we have a lot of, and, and by the way, majority of revenue originates here, right? This is where our mobile business was. This is where our CTV business, where we connect the dots. When we started, then we started adding, sorry, when we started adding app science capabilities and insights, that further created stickiness to our brand. You saw 72% of renewal revenue coming from, but then you add this component of unique supply. Now what happens is this is a effective tool to mitigate any kind of margin cost issues with that. So as we get more supply in here, roughly 75% of the supply that goes to Sabio comes directly from Vidalia. And, and whatever supply we are not using, we are now pushing that supply out to other partners. Now what happens is not everyone gets to integrate and some of the things we're going to do a better job of doing, and this is why we're getting hurt in public markets. You know, the question is, I don't get it. The question I get asked, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong is I think a previous speaker talked about micro cap situation. We're fairly new, but beyond that is the fact that we literally, we're going to do more press releases around all the things we're doing. But as we integrate more supply here, it gives us an opportunity not only provide value to Savio customers, but then serve out uh, those impressions and ads to other people. I mean, inventory to other folks. Yeah, sure. Right. Sure. Sure. So what happens, what tends to happen in our uh, ad tech, in the ad tech space, is you have a lot of folks who come in and do testing and then, you know, don't come back for um, a second campaign or their short-lived campaigns. And so in, in our case, what ha is happening is we have a high level of stickiness connected to it. So I know you're probably comparing it to SaaS where it's like you get the SaaS deal, you're in, you're locked in for a renewal period of time, you're locked in for the year, and then you kind of go in. In our space, in the advertising ad tech space, Priorities will change and the clients will say, listen, McDonald's will say, look, Happy Meal is big. We're going to push this this year. Um, and, you know, this is really where our spender is going to go. And the next year we're going to, you know, or in the next few months, we're going to focus in on, you know, something else, breakfast. So their priorities do change based off of that. It's not simply a product, a platform they use. And now they're using the platforms. That's where our SaaS business will eventually hopefully be. But today, the way the deals operate is we are getting more long-term deals, but these are in, sa in, in ad tech, you tend to have more churn with, with kind of the, with brands. But in our case, 72% is, is pretty strong overall compared to it. And I think if you compare to us, um, I mean, I mean, you know, I think we're comparable to someone like a Magnite, uh, very closely and you can look at our numbers relative to theirs. And I think it's, it's very close overall.
our deals. Um, what happens is it's basically invoice at the end. We get a commitment up front. Uh, and some of these commitments are three, six months, a year commitments. And then what will happen is we will then, as soon as that deal is done, they will then invoice us on a monthly basis. We'll invoice them on a monthly basis and get paid accordingly. A net 60 and 30 days. And so the, the deal sizes we have relative to SaaS, I know we're all zero, is, is a lot higher than what you usually see. Great. Thank you for your time.